Welcome to Project Headcanon. If you're watching this, it means my grand canonical playthrough of Knights of the Old Republic and my corresponding edits to the wiki are finally complete. Based on the channel analytics, there's a good chance you discovered this channel because of that series. If so, I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I did creating it. But please don't feel obligated to stick around now that it's done, unless you really want to. Anyway, as with the KOTOR 2 series, this video will serve as a counterpart to the content crosshair video I made at the start of the series to talk about my specific run through the game and my feelings about certain parts of it. Let's go. It's 3956 BBY, and the galaxy is once again at war. Darth Revan is gone, but his former apprentice Darth Malak rules the Sith. The Endar Spire is attacked by the Sith, and the survivors crash land on Terrace. Kartho Nassi and another Republic soldier explore Terrace to try to find Bastila Shan, Jedi Knight and Mission Commander. They eventually rescue her with some help from Mission Veo and Zalbar. Then, with help from T3M4 and Kandorus Ordo, they steal the freighter Ebon Hawk to escape Terrace as the Sith bomb the planet into smithereens behind them. The crew heads to Dantooine, where the Republic soldier is found to be Force-sensitive and hurriedly inducted into the Jedi Order. After rescuing Juhani from the dark side, he is made a Padawan. His mission is to locate several star maps that point toward the location of something called the Starforge, which may be the key to stopping Darth Malak's forces. The search for the star maps takes the Padawan and his companions to several planets across the galaxy. On Tatooine, they purchase an assassin droid called HK-47, do some diplomacy with the local sand people, and recover the star map from the cave of a crate dragon. On Kashyyyk, they join up with an old hermit named Jolie Bindo, locate the star map in the depths of the jungle, and help free the local Wookiee population from corporate slavers. On Manan, they interact with the neutral Selkath people, and eventually travel underwater to reach the star map, where Republic Kulto mining had awoken a giant sea monster. Upon leaving Manan, the crew gets captured by the Sith warship Leviathan. They almost manage to escape when they come face to face with Darth Malak who reveals that the Republic soldier turned Padawan is, in fact, Darth Revan, who had been captured by the Jedi and had his memory erased. Bastila is captured by Malak, but the others escape in the Ebon Hawk. After coming to grips with that revelation, the crew then flies to Korriban, where Revan infiltrates the Sith Academy posing as a student to gain access to the final star map, which is buried in the Valley of the Dark Lords. Taken together, the star maps point to a system in the Unknown Regions. The crew flies there and discovers that the Starforge is a gigantic space factory powered by the sun. However, they crash land on an unknown world inhabited by Rakata. There, they briefly encounter Bastila, who had been turned to the dark side by Darth Malak. While the Republic launches a full-scale attack on the Starforge, Revan and his crew slip past its defenses and board it. Revan fights and then redeems Bastila to the light side, and then kills Darth Malak after an intense lightsaber duel. The Sith force is defeated, the Republic and Jedi survivors celebrate their victory. Roll credits. First of all, let me just say that I'm very glad I chose to do KOTOR 2 before KOTOR 1. This route was much more difficult to create than the sequel. The main reason is, of course, the companion quests. Unfortunately, while it is possible to complete every single companion quest in a single playthrough, there isn't a single route that allows the primary plot to be completed efficiently while also completing every party member's quest by the time the fifth star map is found. There are a bunch of complicated rules for when and where certain events take place, resulting in a tangled, interconnected web of logic to sort through. I think the route I ended up with is pretty close to optimal, though it requires two brief detours to Tatooine, one right after the Leviathan and one right before Lehan. We can justify this in-universe as Revan first taking a break to process the big reveal, and later him stealing himself before going to the Starforge. I also ended up doing a bit more video editing this run than with KOTOR 2. This game has a bunch of cyclical dialogue trees, meaning a lot of repetitive, let's go back to my previous question sort of options. I cut those out whenever they felt too contrived for a real-life conversation. I gave a bit more thought to the positioning of the companion banter and conversations as well. In particular, I did a lot with Joe Lee on Manan. He's a fascinating character, and weaving his many lessons and stories into the Manan plot gave him a more prominent narrative role than a typical run might. The way I set up the conversations, it's also implied that his advice is the main reason Revan and Bastila chose to start their romantic relationship. Speaking of that relationship, 
I tried to make it clear that, while not a bad thing per se, their relationship does become a potential weakness for both of them. Bastila's temporary fall to the dark side was due in no small part to where she and Revan left their relationship right before the Leviathan. When Bastila is captured, Revan cares more about rescuing her than finding the Starforge, an echo of his choice to fight in the Mandalorian Wars. For me, Revan is a tragic hero. While his willpower to resist the dark side is unnaturally strong, his fatal flaw is a gigantic savior complex. Everyone around him who needs help is suddenly and overwhelmingly his responsibility. Helping people is generally in keeping with the light side of the Force, but in my view, Revan would be willing to alienate his loved ones, or even fall to the dark side himself, long before he'd be willing to let them suffer or die on his behalf. Frankly, it's a wonder that Revan didn't fall, either to the dark side or to pieces, way sooner than he did. Although Revan was given a second chance to save the galaxy, he's fundamentally the same person who placed it in jeopardy in the first place. In the end, he does save it, atoning in some sense for his actions as Dark Lord of the Sith. But as Ezkiel explains in KOTOR 2, Suffice to say redemption was not Revan's choice. He never learns the lessons he should have from his experiences. If anything, his drive to right the wrongs committed by his past self would only aggravate his savior complex after the big reveal. Revan wasn't redeemed, he was reset. Though the game ends in triumph, to me it leaves Revan still poised at the top of a very slippery slope, at the bottom of which lies yet more death and destruction for an already maimed galaxy. The game's theme is clear. Helping others is good, being selfish is bad, and you are in control of your destiny by the choices you make between them. My reading of Revan is a bit darker, especially for a light-sided run, and possibly a bit farther from what the creators intended. Part of that comes from KOTOR 2 and the KOTOR comics, which offer more perspectives on Revan's actions before the game. On the other hand, given the dialogue options available to the player, it's hard to dismiss the possibility that this subtext was intended. At the end of the day, it's my headcanon, so I can read into it however I want, but I'm curious if anyone watching this has any different interpretations that I may have overlooked. But enough about themes, let's talk continuity. Of course, I've already declared this game to be 100% canon within Project Headcanon. Fortunately, especially compared to KOTOR 2, this playthrough story matches very closely to the version on Wikipedia, with a few small exceptions. First, instead of rescuing the Aqualish arms dealer in the North Apartments, Revan gets his Sith Trooper armor from the party he's invited to in the Upper City Cantina. This approach is a bit more in keeping with Karth's low-profile suggestion, and it gives the regular Sith troops a touch of humanity early on, which they really don't get anywhere else. Wikipedia has Candorus receiving Jagi's challenge on Tatooine, but that's not actually possible in the game. In my run, he receives it a bit later, on Manan, and meets the challenge during the first detour to Tatooine. On the Leviathan, I had T3M4 be the one to rescue the party, since he hadn't had a chance to save the day since Terrace, and I felt kind of bad for him. I had Revan talk to the Ones tribe on Lehan before visiting the Elders. This allows for a bit more background of the One and his tribe to be shown. It makes sense that Revan would first try to find a diplomatic solution between the Rakata, though the game obviously doesn't let you in the long run. A few other minor changes are due to the mods I used. Zor is a human now, instead of a Twi'lek. Nijata is Aqualish instead of human, and Tariga is a woman now. Bendak Starkiller is killed without any dark side alignment shift. Deadeye Duncan makes a brief appearance on Manan. And Juhani gets a new outfit and keeps her blue lightsaber. As far as I know, I made exactly two actual mistakes when recording the playthrough. One was a missed conversation with Juhani on the Ebon Hawk between Detuin and Tatuin, and one was a missed conversation with Yukalaka on the way out of his shop after purchasing HK-47. I put comments under the relevant videos with transcripts of those conversations. Though this game affects more than a thousand articles on the wiki, most required absolutely zero editing. The few exceptions were for the reasons I just mentioned. Apart from that, my only other changes to the wiki have been to replace the game's screenshots with corresponding ones from my installation of the game, complete with the graphical mods and higher resolution textures. Rather than hunt down still frames from the videos of the run, I just warped around the game with cheats and used the game's inbuilt screenshot function to take them. I also extracted some frames from my upscaled versions of the pre-rendered cutscenes. And I think that covers everything.
I hope I've been able to make it clear why I like the KOTOR games so much. They add a lot of depth and nuance to the Star Wars universe, treating it with the utmost reverence while using it as a springboard to explore some fascinating characters, deliver one of the best plot twists in video game history, and, most importantly of all, they are unafraid to actually say something meaningful. I'm almost sad to leave them behind, but we have plenty more Star Wars media to cover. Up next, we'll set our sights on an expansive and underappreciated collection of stories, many of which tie in closely with the KOTOR games. Until then, may the Force be with you.